Okay, let's get started. Welcome everyone. Uh, and welcome to the WIFA lecture series. This is a new uh, WIFA lecture for the 2021. And today we are very, very happy to have Kate Waldock from Columbia Business, uh, Columbia Law School now, <laughs> Law. Um, to talk about bankruptcy of, of small firms. Oh my gosh. And you will know why I actually um, kind of said it wrong. So Kate um, has a great research on bankruptcy and the related field, but also has uh, one of the most interesting academic careers that uh, I think among us two who have. She got her PhD from NYU Stern with a PhD in finance a, f uh, a few years ago and started in Georgetown Business School as assistant professor in finance and publishing finance journals and so on. And last year, um, Kate moved to Columbia Law School as a law student because of her passion for the <laughs> law and for the study of bankruptcy. And uh, she started her JD at uh, Columbia Law School and she's a research fellow with the Milstein Center and the first student to enter the academic scholars program at Columbia Law. And as I said earlier, Kate's research interests are in bankruptcy, corporations, banking, and so on and so forth. And besides all those uh, law, business, teaching, research, and so on, she was also a co-host of a very famous podcast called Capitalism with Luigi Zingales. And you can still find a lot of podcasts uh, on wherever you take your podcasts, okay? So today I'm very looking forward to what Kate has to say on the bankruptcy of small firms and all the interactions we might have. Just some um, ground row rules. If you have questions, you can put them in, in the chat and, uh, and Kate made my answer uh, in the middle and Kate might also stop in the every 20, 30 minutes just to take questions. And after the lecture, we will also have some time uh, to interact um, with each other as well. So with that, I will hand the floor to Kate and the stage is yours, welcome. Thanks so much, Song, and thank you for that very kind introduction. Uh, I've really enjoyed this lecture series so far. I think it's been fun and educational, and so I'm honored to be part of the program. Uh, today, I will be talking about bankruptcy of the small firm. But before I start, I wanted to point out and recognize that today's Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And so to all of those of you who are in the US, uh, it's a national holiday, uh, who are joining me, I wanted to thank you for taking your time out of your holiday to, uh, to come and attend this lecture. And for those of you who couldn't attend because you're celebrating the life of Dr. King, um, I wanted you to know that I'm always available by email if you end up watching this lecture after the fact. Uh, and so I wanted to point out a quotation that I thought was particularly apt um, from Dr. King, which is that we must accept finite disappointment but never lose infinite hope. And this resonated with me partially because of the coronavirus. It just feels at this point like it's dragged on forever. You know, we've, some of us have gone a full year without seeing our close family and friends. And even though there's a vaccine right around the corners, some of you might have already been vaccinated. Uh, but to me, it still feels like it's gonna go on and it keeps dragging on and it's never gonna end. But hopefully there is a finite amount of time until it's over. And hopefully that finite amount of time is actually pretty short and we'll all be post COVID in a few months. Uh, now, the second reason that I picked this quotation is because it's a nice way of foreshadowing the concept of limited liability, which is important for the failure of small businesses and which I will, uh, I'll get to in a few slides. So starting with the question, why study bankruptcy? Right? I like to call this the dismal side of the dismal science. And in particular for small businesses, it's really sad when they fail. So why would you study this? Well, the main reason is that bankruptcy affects all firms. If you have you know, regular brain like me, you might anticipate that the rules of bankruptcy should affect firms that are distressed. It'll affect the way that creditors and debtors negotiate around default, and it'll affect the way that assets are efficiently reallocated to potentially more productive uses. But if you have galaxy brain, which is what I expect all of you to have, then you might even understand that bankruptcy rules affect healthy firms, even firms that are far away from the point of distress. And the reason for that is that they rationally anticipate that if something goes bad for them in the future, they might still be affected by bankruptcy rules. 
And so in that sense, even for healthy firms, bankruptcy can affect the extensive margin. It can affect which firms decide to enter into entrepreneurship. And it can also affect the intensive margin, right? How much debt firms choose to take on in their capital structure and the resulting real consequences of that, such as investment. I think that bankruptcy is an understudied field, partially due to data issues and also partially because it's rich in institutional detail. This little word cloud here demonstrates you know, some of the terms, some of the jargon that exists in the bankruptcy world. But there really are a lot of facts that you have to be able to wrap your head around to, to do research in bankruptcy. I personally love that. That's part of the reason that I decided to go to law school. But I do think that it deters some economic researchers. Uh, but one of my favorite parts about doing bankruptcy research is that it gives you this unique view into the corporate decision making process. So if you actually start to dig through bankruptcy files, things that are, that are on PACER, which I can describe in a few slides, then you'll start to see arguments between creditors and debtors talking about debt overhang and talking about risk shifting and talking about holdup problems. All of these frictions, which we usually discuss and think about in the abstract when it comes to corporate finance, but which you can see discussed by bankruptcy participants in court filings. And so that part I think is pretty cool. So here's a roadmap of the presentation. I'm going to start with a quick overview of what Chapter 11 is. A couple of caveats here. Uh, first is that I'm going to start out by talking about Chapter 11 procedure for all firms, big and small. Second is that I'm not going to talk about Chapter 7 or Chapter 13 or any of the other chapters of the Bankruptcy Code for several reasons. One is that liquidation is kind of more straightforward. There aren't that many variations in how liquidations take place, aside from just who's doing the actual liquidation. Whereas in chapter 11, there are many competing tensions and frictions that can influence the efficiency of the process. The other point to note is that uh, small businesses can be reorganized in chapter 13 if they're sole proprietorships. But for the most part, I wanna be thinking about small businesses that have limited liability, which aren't sole proprietorships. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a couple of slides as well. So after the overview, I'm gonna talk about small business capital structures, how they tend to look a little bit different from large business capital structures. And then I'll go into the literature on federal bankruptcy. So I'll talk about some of the key areas for research, uh, a lot of the common questions that have been asked in this literature, as well as data sources. And I'll briefly mention the Small Business Reorganization Act of 2020, which just came into effect 11 months ago, right? Not even a full year ago, and which I think is a profound change from the system for small business reorganization that we used to have. Now, the reason that I highlighted or underlined federal is to distinguish it from state debtor creditor law. Now, small businesses, when they fail, some of them file for bankruptcy, but then some of them just rely on state level laws. And the distinction is that if you're filing for a federal bankruptcy procedure, then no matter what state you file in, you're subject to the same set of rules. Whereas if you decide to go out of business and rely on state laws, then those rules will change depending on which state you're in. And so that's pretty relevant for many experimental designs in this area. I'll briefly touch on research on high growth startups, and then I'll conclude with some closing thoughts and kind of more unorthodox, but what I think are promising areas for research in the field. So let's start out with the chapter 11 overview. Here I am showing a typical chapter 11 case timeline and then I'll present some stylized facts. So you start out chapter 11 with a bankruptcy petition and then over the course of the next several weeks or months, usually the bankrupt firm is supposed to submit key information to the court. That information includes what the capital structure looks like, what the reasons are for filing for bankruptcy and who owns claims on the firm. Now for a typical full bankruptcy, some of you might be familiar with um, prepackaged bankruptcies. I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about like the full reorganization process. Those usually take about a year and a half before the firm submits a plan of reorganization. So that at that point, the plan is filed. There's some additional negotiating that goes back and forth between the court, the claim holders and the debtor. And then there's a vote on the plan. If all classes of the plan approve the plan, and the court confirms the plan, then the plan is approved and then distributions are made according to what's in the plan. So some stylized facts that help put a little bit of perspective on this whole process. 
First is that the automatic stay usually remains in place. What's the automatic stay? The automatic stay keeps the creditors away. If you want like a jingle to keep in your head. Uh, so the idea is that secured creditors, once you file for bankruptcy, they can't come in and seize their collateral in foreclosure. Uh, so that's, it gives the debtor a little bit of breathing room throughout the bankruptcy process. Secured creditors can file motions with the court to remove the automatic stay, but most of the time the stay remains in place until the bankruptcy has been administered. Most plans are prepared by the debtor, i.e. the firm's managers. Um, it is in theory possible for creditors or you know, pretty much any plan participant, the government, to come up with their own plan of reorganization or a plan of liquidation. But for the most part, the plans that we see submitted to the court and the plans that get confirmed at the end of the day are plans that were constructed by the bankrupt company's managers. Most bankrupt firms are insolvent. This is kind of a debatable point because we never really know what the true value of a bankrupt firm's assets are because the vast majority of them are not traded during bankruptcy. But still, what's relevant about this point is that uh, most of the time, at least in large bankruptcy cases, equity holders receive no recovery whatsoever. That means that to the extent that a firm is reorganized, all of the new equity in the reorganized firm is granted to the old creditors. Now, most plans are confirmed through a vote, which I mentioned earlier. The voting rule is that for each class, and the classes are defined according to the plan, the members of that class must accept the plan by one half in number and two thirds in dollar amount. Now, most plans are confirmed by the vote, but there is an option for the judge to cram down the plan on a dissenting class of creditors, right? If a class of creditors decides that they wanna reject the plan, but the judge feels like the plan is important and fair, then the judge can force the plan or cram them down on the creditors. This is usually used as a threat point though. Uh, and in most large bankruptcies, doesn't actually take place. Now, there was an old system for small business bankruptcies prior to the Reorganization Act of last year. It was pretty similar to the Chapter 11 of a typical large business. The deadlines are a little bit tighter. There was a little bit more oversight from the US Trustee's Office, which is you know, a group of trustees who just make sure that the process moves along. And some requirements were waived, such as the Unsecured Creditors Committee. But for the most part, the old small business Chapter 11 was identical to the large business Chapter 11, at least in terms of procedure. Now, I'd like to talk a bit about the small business capital structure and how it differs from the large firm. But before I do that, uh, I wanted to insert a couple additional caveats. Number one is that as you can probably tell at this point, I'm gonna focus mostly on uh, US bankruptcy and US debtor creditor law, because this is an area where there's so much actual law involved. If I were to talk about a number of different countries, then I could probably spend the entire day just talking about the institutional details. So unfortunately, I'm gonna be limited to, to one country here. Even though I will mention um, other reorganization systems when I talk a little bit about ex-ante efficiency. Uh, the second point or caveat that I wanted to insert is that uh, I am going to be focusing on businesses with limited liability. So you might be familiar with different forms of organization, uh, sole proprietorships, limited liability companies, corporations. There's a lot of background detail there and I'm not really gonna go into it in great depth. What I want you to have in the back of your head is that we're talking about a small business with limited liability. So it's not a sole proprietorship. Maybe it has you know, 10 to 20 employees, it has some debt in the capital structure, uh, it has some commercial leased space. And for these reasons, the owner and manager of the small business decided to form as an LLC or a small corporation to protect themselves with limited liability. So let's imagine what hey, this- Hey, can I interrupt yes. with two questions? Sure. So one is from the chat channel, which is basically a clarification questions, which is, do old equity holders lose everything after restructuring, basically um, uh, from the data and stylized fact? Does it mean that they lose everything after restructuring? The second thing is, I think this is also part of uh, the papers uh, that you wrote with uh, ED and uh, Stool and so on. Basically, during this process, if we think about small businesses, they actually reallocate a lot of uh, assets in the bankruptcy or post the bankruptcy. Where does it happen? Maybe this is something that you're going to talk later in the talk, 
But I think the paper that you have with uh, ED and stool mentions that asset allocation starts very quickly, um, like through 363 and uh, and 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 uh, uh, and stuff like that. Um, uh, so if yeah. I understand your second question, it's kind of at what point in the process does the yeah. asset reallocation happen? Yes. So if we're talking about small businesses, I mean, one of the points that I'll get to in a second is that yeah. traditionally small businesses have not relied on the bankruptcy code because it's uh. been harsh on them. And so in that respect, you know, if you're focusing just on small businesses, the bankruptcy code kind of hasn't worked at all. There hasn't been much asset reallocation, mm -hmm. which is why I'm going to talk about some of the state debtor creditor laws and other ways in which they can kind of retain the assets of their firm. So I guess the answer is that it's kind I of see. complicated, but we don't really see as many pre-organized 363 sales in small business bankruptcy the mm -hmm. same way that we would for large businesses. Awesome. And then for the then, quest, or first question is... Uh, do active holders actually lose everything after restructuring? Yeah, the short answer is yes, they lose everything, right? Because if a business is insolvent, then they shouldn't get anything because the creditors can't be made whole. And so the creditors deserve all the equity in the new business, or at least like the unsecured creditors who can't be made whole. Uh, now that's not entirely true because oftentimes equity holders are granted warrants on the new firm. Um, this is a relatively understudied area, but I think that the simple answer is no. Uh, equity holders don't get anything in the new firm. Yeah, I, I think every out. also ask a follow-up question uh, uh, is, is uh, what is the small business in this talk? Uh, for really small business, liquidation is very common. I think this is a point that you were touching on already, uh, so feel free to postpone, but I think this question perhaps is in a lot of people's minds, um, the small yeah. businesses and so on. Yeah. Yes, yeah, liquidation is very common. Even though in the background, uh, there are sneaky ways in which small businesses can try and reorganize you know, outside of the scope of the bankruptcy system. And I'll talk about how they can do that when it comes to state debtor creditor laws. Um, okay, so going back to the typical capital structure of a small business, what really distinguishes it from large businesses is that there's this combination of owner insider capital and then outsider capital. So by owner insider capital, I mean basically savings of the business manager. Uh, you know, if you want to start a small business, maybe you've saved up $60,000 and that's going to be your own personal startup capital. So owner in insider equity uh, consists of things like personal savings, family savings. And then for those who are a little bit more cautious about their capital, they might actually issue a personal loan to the business. But small businesses also seek external sources of financing. And by the way, before I proceed, I should mention that this capital structure picture that I have here uh, is roughly taken from the Kaufman firm survey, which is a data source I'll discuss in a couple of slides. Uh, this is meant to represent kind of your typical medium stage small business. So by medium stage, I mean kind of at a middle point in a firm's life cycle, not when it's distressed and not when it has just started up. Um, but another point to make is that here we're talking about equity and debt as sources of capital, right? When you talk about the capital structure of a large business, you wanna think about like the theoretical value of the firm, but for small businesses, we really don't know what the theoretical value of a small business is. And so the best that we can do to approximate the capital structure is to just look at its sources of capital. So anyway, turning to outsiders, um, affiliated investors might provide outsider equity. So let's say, a friend of a friend or someone you know through your professional network that's charitable enough to invest in the equity of your business. To the extent that we're talking about high growth startups, this category includes angel financing and venture capital, but I don't want you to think about a high growth startup as kind of your representative small business. I will talk about those later on in the lecture, but for now, I just want you to think of like kind of more of a, a retail chain with like three or four restaurants in a, a town or a city, but not a business that has like a ton of potential to grow quickly in the future. Now, small businesses also um, rely heavily on outsider debt. Outsider debt can come from many sources. That, that can be bank loans, which are typically secured, business credit cards, which are typically unsecured, as well as government loans, uh, like loans from the Small Business Administration. Those are also typically secured, but as we've seen through the PPP, uh, those were not required to be secured. And so the government loans can be either way. And a couple additional points that I wanted to make about the small business capital structure 
is that commercial leases are really important. There's not a whole lot of uh, research on commercial leases and small businesses. But if you look at um, what small businesses report, in terms of their monthly expenditures, uh, the amount of money that they spend on their lease payments is second only to payroll. And so they do constitute kind of an, an important fixed expense that's got a fixed lifetime, is contractually predetermined, and so it has a lot of the flavors of debt. And then finally, an extremely important point that I want to make is that the whole theory behind limited liability is that the business assets are kind of separated or divorced from the personal assets of the small business owner. So if the business owner can't pay the outsider debt of their business, well, at least their personal assets are protected. That's the theory. But in reality, a lot of small business owners have to pledge their own personal assets uh, as guarantees for outsider debt, as well as guarantees for commercial leases. And so those guarantees kind of blend the lines between limited liability and unlimited liability. And a lot of the rules that you see in state debtor creditor law kind of try to partition or kind of put rules or encircle the personal assets of the business owner. And uh, as we'll see, in some sense, they can try and protect the small business owner. But in other senses, state debtor creditor law um, ensures that business owners can't tunnel assets from the business into their personal bank accounts. So I'll get to those in a little bit. Uh, at this point, I wanted to stop for questions. Anything else? Clearly, I interrupted too early, but I-, I <laughs> No, I think you interrupted at the right time. All right. All right, I'm gonna proceed. So here I'd like to talk kind of from a, a basic, but also a big picture sense about what the literature looks like for people who do research in bankruptcy and in particular small business bankruptcy. Uh, and I'd like to start with ex post efficiency, this idea of you know, conditional on being distressed, how good are the rules at efficiently reallocating assets and making sure that distress, or at least financial distress, is uh, worked out well. So the first question in a lot of people's minds, because we often start learning about finance through the Modigliani-Miller theorem, is how high are direct and indirect bankruptcy costs? And so the research here has generally pointed to the fact that for small businesses, bankruptcy costs are really high. Right? The smaller you get, bankruptcy costs as a fraction of the firm's value tend to go up. Uh, this Breeze, Welch, and Jew paper from 2006 put a range of about 0% of firm assets to 20% of firm assets. They were looking at both big and small firms. And so as, as you get smaller, I think you tend to approach that 20% uh, number. Another common question is, are assets efficiently reallocated? And that can seem kind of like a broad question. And so another way of framing this is, are bad firms excessively reorganized? Or conversely, are good firms excessively liquidated? Right? There's kind of this balance and this tension between the two, and we don't actually know which way things fall unless we do research. And here the research has been mixed. Um, so there's two kind of more legal papers that nonetheless use uh, empirical results. And those tend to weigh on the side that there might be uh, an inefficient, excessive continuation problem, that too many bad small firms are being reorganized. Now, conversely, there's research by Bernstein, Colinelli, and Iverson. Uh, they've actually published several papers together. And so going forward, I'm going to call them Ben Iverson and co-authors. Uh, but in this field, they have done a study uh, looking kind of at the whole like, cross-section of firms, both big and small. And they have pointed out that when firms are liquidated, it seems to be that those assets are not efficiently reallocated to their best uses compared to firms that are reorganized. So to the extent that there are frictions in our bankruptcy system that cause excessive liquidation, then this can be inefficient. Another question is, do secured creditors or any bankruptcy participant for that matter, have excessive control? Or is control allocated to the right people to ensure that assets will be efficiently reallocated? This is a popular topic in large firm bankruptcy. And there's, you know, I mean, there's hundreds of papers in large firm bankruptcy that deal with ex post efficiency that I'm not mentioning here. Uh, when it comes to small firm bankruptcy, the research is somewhat limited. There is this memo from the National Bankruptcy Conference uh, from around 2010 
of a working group that was chaired um, by Morrison and Small. As you can see, Morrison has done a lot of research in this area. And they point to the fact that A, small businesses don't really file for bankruptcy very often. It seems like the system is sort of broken for them. And B, one of the reasons that they don't file very often is because secured creditors seem to have too much control. They seem to be able to just come into the bankruptcy and convince the judge to lift the automatic stay and foreclose upon their, uh, their collateral assets. Another question that's common in this literature is, are there spillover consequences? And so here's another paper by Ben Iverson and co-authors that look at the extent to which bankrupt firms can actually have a spillover impact on the firms that are geographically close to them. And as expected, they find that the answer is yes. If the firm is in bankruptcy, then that has negative consequences for the firms that are close by. And there's a ton of descriptive papers in this area. Like I said, mostly pointing to the fact that the bankruptcy system doesn't seem well suited for small businesses and that small businesses don't file for bankruptcy very often. And when they do, they tend to get liquidated or the case is dismissed pretty early on in the bankruptcy. So I'm not gonna list you know, the many papers here. I will point to some of the prominent ones, uh, Sullivan, Warren and Westbrook from the late nineties, Carter and Van Auken from 2006. And then Michelle White has a more recent, uh, nice literature review in this area. So if you're interested in kind of a broad perspective, I would point you to this White 2016 paper. So that's the ex post side. What about the ex anti side? Well, so one thing that I would like to point out is that you'll notice a lot of those ex post papers actually use fine grained data about what firms are in bankruptcy or what happens throughout the course of the bankruptcy? What's the outcome of the bankruptcy? People who study X anti-efficiency tend to use different data sources and different methods. So I'll get to those in a sec. But the, what's the hypothesis that's asked by these X anti-efficiency papers? Well, they tend to focus on changes in bankruptcy laws, whether they're stricter or looser, which I'll define in a second, and how that affects kind of equilibrium levels of startup activity and credit allocated to startups throughout the economy. And so as you can see, these sorts of papers are kind of better suited for using data sources like overall census data rather than bankruptcy specific data. So here's a very simple illustration of the hypothesis of what would happen if bankruptcy law were to become stricter. And by stricter, I mean more creditor friendly. It's easier for creditors to get higher recoveries in bankruptcy. Well, so what this would do is, you know, presumably it would shift the supply of credit outwards. So lenders would be more willing to supply credit uh, either at higher quantities or at lower prices. But at the same time, it might also shift the demand for credit inwards because small business owners, you know, might not like the fact that uh, creditors get higher recoveries. That might mean money in their pocket that they think belongs in their own pocket, but business owner's pocket. And then also to the extent that small business owners are risk averse, then they might fear kind of lower recoveries in bad states of the world. And so if both of these shifts are taking place, then it's pretty clear what's going to happen to prices, right? The price of credit will fall. But what's unclear is what's going to happen to quantity. And by quantity, I mean, in this illustration, I mean, the quantity of credit that's supplied to small businesses. We don't know whether that's going to go up or down. And so that's kind of the open question that a lot of these papers address. But quantity can also refer to real outcomes, right? The quantity of small businesses that decide to start up or, you know, the quantity of patents that are produced by small businesses. Um, and so there are kind of all many numbers of left hand side variables that we see in, in these types of papers. Now, so far, I've focused on uh, outcomes in the United States. And there, there have been some papers on ex post efficiency, but when it comes to ex anti efficiency, there aren't that many papers written using US data. And there's a very clear reason for that. The United States hasn't really changed its bankruptcy laws for many decades. 1979 was when the bankruptcy code as we know it now went into effect, and it hasn't really changed much since then. There was one key exception, uh, BAPSIPA, the Bankruptcy Abuse Prevention and Consumer Protection Act of 2005. Um, but that was mostly for consumer bankruptcy. It didn't have a huge effect on business bankruptcies. You might think that for a sole proprietorship, it's kind of in the gray area between consumer bankruptcy and business bankruptcy. But what this paper by PAC in 2013 showed was that actually, you know, there was no significant impact of BAPSIPA on small business outcomes. 
Now, as I mentioned, there are a couple key uh, cross-country studies or studies abroad of changes to the bankruptcy code that either focus specifically on small businesses or incorporate small businesses into the data sets that they use. Uh, most of these studies have looked at bankruptcy codes that have become, or insolvency regimes, I should say, that have become friendlier to the debtor. So kind of the opposite of what I showed in that diagram, right? It's become worse for creditors and looked at how that affected lending to small businesses as well as startup activity. And uh, what this Boston paper found in Germany was that you know, a debtor-friendly regime actually improved bankruptcy, or sorry, improved equilibrium quantities of credit as well as uh, startup activity amongst entrepreneurs. And looking at a similar kind of flavor of bankruptcy change in Korea, Schoener and Starman's found roughly similar findings um, that a more debtor favorable bankruptcy regime tended to produce more entrepreneurship, but they went a little bit deeper and exploited heterogeneity across risky versus non-risky firms. The Franks and Sussman paper is more complicated. They kind of compare like, the frictions that arise in bankruptcy processes, noting that the UK insolvency regime is more contractually based, whereas in the United States, we have a more court-based bankruptcy regime. And what they find is that the debt structure of uh, small businesses as well as large businesses in the UK tends to reflect the frictions that would arise in those contractual type uh, workouts. And then, you know, there are cross country studies that try and construct measures of, you know, across several countries, which ones have more debtor friendly regimes, which ones have more creditor friendly regimes, and then compare kind of general levels of startup activity of credit to startups. And unsurprisingly, they find that countries that are friendlier to debtors tend to have more entrepreneurship. Actually, I shouldn't have said unsurprisingly because the whole point of this picture was to indicate that it is kind of surprising. We don't know which way it's gonna go. Um, but that, that does send, uh, tend to be the flavor of these papers. Um, okay, so before I move on to data sources, are there any questions about the kind of extant literature in this area? There are actually two questions. Uh, one is uh, a clarification question, I, I think in nature, which is what exactly are bankruptcy costs? Uh, um, is it just lawyers' fees? Uh, clearly not, but, uh, but if you can give us a sense of what you think are the core component in the bankruptcy cost based on the literature, mm -hmm. I think that would be real helpful. And then the second question is also from the chat channel, which is uh, efficient asset allocation since creditors usually do not know firm details and uh, the pre-petition equity holders and managers also cannot manage it well. So it kind of is very difficult to judge whether something is efficient or inefficiently um, allocated because we don't have a counterfactual. What's your take on that? And what are some of the, I think, what are some frontier methods in terms of uh, uh, getting at that question? Yeah. yeah, those are both great questions. Um, I'll start with, again, with the latter question because it's fresher in my mind. Uh, you know, when we're looking at large bankruptcies, then a good way of thinking about efficiency is to actually measure total factor productivity, right? So if you apply for like ASM access, uh, micro data from the census, then you can construct measures of TFP and those are probably the best way of thinking about efficiency. When we talk about small businesses, it's totally different. I mean, first of all, like you're not gonna see much detail about very small businesses in any of the fine-grained census micro data sets. Um, you know, but even if we could, like how well would those really measure true efficiency? And so I think you know, the point is well taken. Um, for those papers I mentioned in this literature, I don't think that they really truly addressed efficiency in the kind of the most perfect sense, but they made assumptions, certain assumptions like, oh, if there's a plant and it used to be occupied and now it's not occupied, that's probably less efficient, things like that. And so they're kind of tricks that you can do. Uh, another is that if you start with the assumption that you know small businesses are not particularly uh, economically efficient, which I think is an unfair assumption, but many people do have that point of view, then if you find that there's reorganization, then any reorganization will be excessive. So that's kind of in the background of the Baird and Morrison paper. Um, you know, it, it, in some sense is assuming the conclusion, uh, but like I said, it's hard to really study true efficiency in bankruptcy. Now, the first question was uh, how do you, or what are direct and indirect bankruptcy costs? Um, great point. 
So first, when we talk about direct bankruptcy costs, as you might have pointed out, that's lawyers' fees, that's court fees, it's U.S. trustee fees. Uh, I think an important part of that, at least for large businesses, is uh, the costs that you have to spend on your investment bankers, right? They have to hire all of like Goldman and all of these investment bankers to help reorganize the business, and they tend to be pretty expensive. In terms of indirect costs, that usually uh, refers to the amount of sales that are lost uh, when the firm is in bankruptcy, because the customers might realize, you know, I don't want to buy like hardware from a bankrupt firm because I won't be able to get their parts later on, things like that. So both of those costs combined are um, what people call bankruptcy costs. Can I also please ask uh, one quick question before we move on there? Um, sure. You had spoken a little bit about the um, kind of the effect of the uh, risk aversion that might have on which uh, direction uh, this graph here is moving. Mm -hmm. um, it, it seems from the papers that it's actually implying that if uh, debt is actually improving entrepreneurship or increasing entrepreneurship, then wouldn't that imply maybe a, not a risk averse, but a risk um, seeking uh, environment? And if you have any more um, elaboration on that, I'd appreciate it. Sure. Well, so it doesn't necessarily imply that. It, I mean, first you need to know which direction was the direction of the bankruptcy change, right? So did it become friendlier towards debtors or friendlier towards creditors? If the bankruptcy change became friendlier towards creditors, right? So the directions that I have here. Uh, and then what you end up seeing is that equilibrium quantities of like startup activity go up, then yes, I guess a, an alternative. So one interpretation of that is that uh, the supply effect dominated. And an alternative interpretation is that uh, the demand for credit you know, shifted outwards or to the right because small businesses are uh, risk loving. So I'm just kind of reframing what you said kind of in, in the context of this picture. Um, I think that you're completely right in that that could be an interpretation of what's going on. Uh, I don't think that most would agree with you. Um, I don't know. I, I can't tell which surveys to refer to. I think there have been surveys indicating that small business owners tend to be risk averse. Uh, they tend to prefer to be able to shield their assets in bad states of the world. I mean, if you just stop and think about it, like we're not talking about payoffs on you know, a stock asset here. We're talking about if your business fails, then you might have your house and your car seized. Uh, and so these tend to be like pretty adverse outcomes and it's hard to believe that anyone would really love to take on that risk. And so even though I agree with, with what you're positing, I would say that uh, most of the psychological literature would, um, would suggest otherwise, which is why you know, I've, I've laid out the shifts in the way that I have. Right. Yeah. Thank you very much for your um, elaboration. I was actually kind of only playing devil's advocate there because I think most of us could at least agree that with the personal assets being a, a major part of the small business. Um, yeah, that makes perfect sense. The outcomes, the negative outcomes are, are pretty substantial. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to see if you had a different take on it. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the question. All right. So absent any other questions, I'm going to talk a bit about the data that people use in this area. Am I doing on time? We'll see. Um, so in terms of firm level data, uh, there are several surveys that I think are really informative as to what the small business capital structure looks like. These include the Kaufman Firm Survey, which was discontinued in 2011. Uh, the Survey of Small Business Finances, unfortunately discontinued in 2003. In some of the older papers, you'll see references to characteristics of business owners discontinued in 1992, and then the Small Business Credit Survey, which actually starts in 2017 and is collected by the Fed. And so there's kind of these disparate sources of information. What defines a small business kind of varies across these surveys. And so it's hard to really get a sense of data that you can like tangibly use about the capital structure in an empirical paper. But if you're trying to get a sense of uh, what the capital structure looks like, and then maybe trying to get ideas for sources of heterogeneity that you could use in an experiment, I would say that you should at least familiarize yourself with the statistics that arise from these surveys. And they're pretty well described in these two papers uh, by Robin Robinson from 2014, as well as Cole from 2016. Now, in terms of more empirical papers, you know, what is usable, uh, a lot of people, at least when looking at ex ante studies of bankruptcy efficiency, will rely on micro census data. That includes the census LBD, the Longitudinal Business Database, as well as the quarterly financial reports. 
What's nice about the LBD is that it really includes every single establishment in the economy. What's not nice about the LBD is that it's pretty limited in the information it provides. So you have like location and payroll and the number of employees, but that's kind of it. Whereas the quarterly financial reports are a random sample of kind of medium sized businesses. And those provide a great deal of detail into like the capital structure, the balance sheet, um, the income statement of small businesses. But like I said, it's just a random sample uh, and you can't necessarily track the same firms over time. In terms of secured debt, um, some people have looked directly at the loan level. There is nice data on uh, loans that have been guaranteed by the SBA. I think there's like several million loans dating back several decades. But the problem with this data set, or at least a caveat that I should insert, is that those SBA loans are highly dictated by rules of the SBA. And so the interest rates that you'll see on those loans aren't really going to vary that much based on like market circumstances. You can also rely on state UCC lien filings, Uniform Commercial Code. Uh, that's a very rich data source, but I should warn you that it's uh, hard data to work with, at least from what I've heard from my friends who have worked with this data. And you also have to really go to each state to retrieve state-specific information. There's no centralized repository of UCC lien filings across the country. And then other data sources include Dun & Bradstreet as well as credit registries. I personally would not uh, recommend Dun & Bradstreet having purchased some data from them before a lot of the fields were completely missing that were important to the study. And then for credit registries, they do have some data on small business financing, but they're mostly geared towards consumer studies. And oftentimes they don't really distinguish between what's uh, business debt and what's consumer debt when you're looking at a small business. And so that can also be tricky. Now for bankruptcy data, a good place to start is by looking at New Generation Research or bankruptcydata.com. Um, they have helpful sources of information along several dimensions, but I think currently their most helpful uh, kind of use is that they give you the universe of bankrupt firms on a daily basis. And so they come out with like an update every single night, which is great if you're doing kind of a real time study of bankruptcy filings. But this has only been the case since roughly 2019, maybe 2018. Before that, they were somewhat ad hoc about which firms they covered. And so uh, just a quick warning about that. Uh, also, if you want the full kind of historical universe of bankruptcies, you can ask directly the Administrative Office of Courts. They'll probably give you a hard time, but will eventually give you what you want. Uh, now, PACER is public access to court electronic records. Um, it's a centralized repository of every single bankruptcy filing dating back to roughly 2004. Um, and the reason for this is, like I said, you know, bankruptcy is a federal system and federal court documents have to be filed online and PACER. The good news about this is that there's kind of a bill uh, before Congress to make PACER free and we should all kind of lobby that PACER becomes free because that would be great from the perspective of researchers. The bad news is that it probably won't actually be implemented anytime within the next couple of years, but it's something to kind of flag for the future. It is scrapable, but it's slow. Um, if you wanna go down this PACER route, I recommend that you just kind of talk to me offline because there's a lot of just PACER specific knowledge. But the main point is that there's different sources of data stored on PACER. And one of the richest sources that's relatively easy to scrape is the docket which is a list of every single action that took place in the bankruptcy. And then once you've scraped the dockets, then you can go and look for specific files or specific documents that you'd like to retrieve. If you're doing research in this area, beware of common mistakes. Levels of aggregation are really confusing on PACER. You know, sometimes you'll have the same firm that just files 20 different bankruptcy cases. And there's really only one case where there's action, but it's hard to know which one it is. And then also note that things like conversion to chapter seven and dismissal don't necessarily equal liquidation. Um, I think this is a common issue that a lot of bankruptcy papers run across. Now, if you're familiar with Ben Iverson's research, he's relied on LexisNexis data for bankruptcy outcomes. Lexis is a very rich source of data on bankruptcy, but you have to scrape at your own risk because they're very unfriendly to researchers scraping. And I think that you might wanna to talk to Ben, but he has run into some trouble uh, from his experience scraping Lexus. All right, any data questions before I talk about the Small Business Reorganization Act? Okay, I'm gonna move on. Oh, I heard a, a mic shuffle. All right, I'm gonna move on. So 
The Small Business Reorganization Act uh, was recently passed. It was first introduced as a bill actually over a decade ago in 2010. And so I don't want you to think that this is kind of a shock to the system in the same way that economists often think that law changes are shocks. Um, it went into effect in February of 2020. It created what's known as subchapter five. Subchapter five is a subchapter of chapter 11 that's specifically for small businesses. And originally the total debt limit to be eligible to file for subchapter five was $2.7 million. Um, but this was increased to, sorry, 2.7 was increased to 7.5 as a result of the CARES Act. Now, as I mentioned at the outset of this presentation, this is a pretty dramatic change to the way that small businesses are going to be reorganized under Chapter 11. And so what are these changes? Well, first, only a debtor can propose a plan of reorganization. So as I mentioned earlier, in theory, creditors or outside participants can also propose their own plans. Under Subchapter 5, it's only the debtor and that plan is due pretty quickly. It's due within 90 days, even though those 90 days can be extended for extenuating circumstances. Another key component is that there's a case trustee or a subchapter five trustee that's assigned to every single small business debtor to help them kind of comb through their finances and come up with a workable plan of reorganization or liquidation. So the case trustee is present throughout most of the plan. Now, this is the one point that economists like to focus on, which is that Subchapter five allows debtors to retain ownership and control of the business after emergence. Now, if we're talking about insolvent small businesses as we often are, this is technically a violation of the absolute priority rule, right? If you let a small business reorganize under chapter 11 and you're letting the small business owner kind of retain all of the equity in the new business, but the creditors aren't being paid in full, that's a violation of you know, the, the well-loved APR rule. And so this is probably where most think uh, the most dramatic shift is taking place. In terms of confirmation, acceptance by every class is not needed to confirm the plan. Uh, in other words, the Small Business Reorganization Act or, or SIBRA makes cram down much easier by the judge. And if a plan is crammed down on some of the creditors, then the case will remain open until every single distribution is made. So unlike in a large business chapter 11, where once the plan is confirmed, uh, the case can be dismissed. And if the debtor can't meet all of the payments, then they have the option to refile for chapter 11 in what's known as chapter 22, or file again, chapter 33. For a small business case, at least the ones that are crammed down um, the case will extend until all the payments have been made, which is usually supposed to be over the course of two to five years after the plan. So here's uh, a figure showing the daily incidence of Chapter 11 filings for firms with assets of less than $10 million following the onset of the pandemic, as well as the effective date of SIBRA. And as you can see, this is kind of surprising for two reasons. Number one is that SIBRA made bankruptcy much friendlier to small businesses. And so we should expect a big increase in the rate of bankruptcy filing. Number two is that with the onset of the pandemic, a lot of researchers were expecting for there to be a flood of bankruptcies. And in fact, we saw the opposite. It seems like small businesses really you know, shut down their filing rates, at least for a period of time, several months uh, after um, the pandemic hit. So an interesting paper by Ben and some of his co-authors um, is kind of digging into that, thinking about how COVID in theory affected bankruptcy filings and pulling apart uh, kind of the mechanisms at play here and trying to come up with um, a reason for why they kind of fell off a cliff. And they not only look at chapter 11, they also look at the other chapters of bankruptcy. I have embarked upon very preliminary research with Ed Morrison, who's uh, at Columbia Law, on looking at the effect of SIBRA on bankruptcy outcomes. Um, those of you who are PhD students, actually probably everyone when they saw the debt cut off of like 7.5 million immediately thought like regression discontinuity. And so that's kind of what we're going after. But the problem is that there just haven't been that many bankruptcy filings, especially not right around that $7.5 million cutoff. And so we're kind of just doing a simple diff to look at whether the firms um, that have filed under subchapter five differ substantially from those that haven't. Uh, some quick statistics. So in the first three months after the effective date of SIBRA, uh, about 40% uh, 
of small businesses filed under subchapter five, which I think is kind of surprisingly low. Um, only 20% of them have reached the plan confirmation stage so far as of you know, a couple of weeks ago, but of those 20% of confirmed small business plans, over 80% have been in subchapter five. And so this is very, very early evidence that subchapter five seems to be working. Now here are some um, kind of ideas that I'd like to pitch. Uh, they're denoted by stars and you know, they're probably not good ideas because they're not things that I have decided to go after, but you know, I'll, I'll pitch them nonetheless. So one is a theory paper for why small businesses and small business bankruptcy is different than large business bankruptcy. Um, in some sense, the value of the firm is owner contingent, right? So if the owner of a small business decides to leave the business, then most small businesses are virtually worthless. And so the question is, although on one hand, if you look at the rules of Sibra, they allow for the violation of absolute priority, this seems like it would hurt small businesses because it would be bad for creditors. On the other hand, in order to really incentivize a small business owner who kind of is core, that person's human capital is core to the future value of the business, you have to give them some equity to convince them to stick around. So kind of mapping out the theoretical trade-off there, uh, I haven't seen so far in the finance literature and I think that that would be pretty cool. I've never seen any papers looking at the holdup power of landlords in bankruptcy. And I know that I haven't really described landlord rules very much, um, it's complicated, but note that for large businesses, say J. Crew going bankrupt, if they wanna close down like a quarter of their locations and relocate down the street, it's not going to have a huge effect on J. Crew. Whereas for a small business, if you operate out of one kind of commercial storefront, then losing that commercial lease, you know, even though in theory you could write off a lease and uh, join a new lease or enter into a new contract, it might have a significant negative effect on the value of your business if people are used to you being in that one location. And so part of the reason for voting rules in Chapter 11 is to reduce holdup power of various uh, claims of, of creditors and bankruptcy parties. But for small businesses, landlords actually have a significant amount of holdup power. And so it'd be interesting to look at that and either from a theoretical but also an empirical perspective, although empirically it, it's gonna be pretty difficult. Um, random judge assignment is uh, a methodological instrument that has been used in some of this literature. I personally have been somewhat critical of it, but I think that when you're looking at small businesses, it is a more kind of valid source of exogenous variation. I also think that part of the difficulty in using random judge assignment at looking, looking at bankruptcy outcomes for large businesses is that large business organizations can take a really long time and the judge can interact in many different ways with the bankrupt debtor. Whereas for small businesses, one of the most common ways in which they fail in bankruptcy is that they don't submit the information that's required. Right? Small businesses just don't have the knowledge or the wherewithal or the foresight to put together the documents that are required by the court. So you'll have some judges that are really harsh when it comes to filing rules or you know, reporting requirements and some judges that are pretty lenient. And so there, I think you, know, you could get some interesting exogenous variation based on random judge assignment and how lenient they are about the filing requirements at the outset of the bankruptcy. And then finally, a very natural question to ask is, what are the ex ante impacts of this new small business bankruptcy rule on say, you know, credit to small businesses and rates of entrepreneurship? I just warn you to be very careful, as you can see from this, uh, COVID is a huge confounding factor. And so at least for now, I don't think that uh, there's any way to answer this question without avoiding the, the confoundingness of COVID. Maybe in a few years, we can say something more meaningful about the impact of this reform on small business bankruptcy, but I don't think that we've got to that stage yet. All right, so now I'd like to talk about uh, state debtor creditor law. I'm way behind time. So um, do we have yeah, any I mean, questions? I, or can I, I just want on? to mention one thing, which is we do have, we, I did see a lot of questions accumulating in the chat, okay. but because we are behind time, I do want Kate to be able to like spend enough time in the lecture. I think maybe after we finish the whole lecture, we can get back to all those questions all together. How does that sound, Kate? Okay, yeah, that sounds good. Unless anyone like really has a clear, okay, sounds good. I'm just gonna go on. Yeah. Uh, state debtor creditor law. So I really wanna make sure that I talk about this because it's very important. Why is it important? 
two reasons. Number one is that even though federal bankruptcy procedure is a set of federal rules, there are certain areas where they can defer to a state law. And so I'll talk about some of those common areas in a minute, but actually a firm going through bankruptcy is complying with some rules that are federal and some rules that they can opt to use uh, state rules. And so it's, it's actually like a complicated mesh of laws. But the more important reason that state law is important as opposed to bankruptcy law is that at most 20% of failing small businesses actually file for bankruptcy. Uh, this is a statistic found by Ed Morrison in 2009. If you look at the recent rate of bankruptcy filings, it's much worse. So just kind of comparing numbers coming out from Yelp to the actual number of bankruptcies that have been filed since the beginning of the pandemic, it seems like only 2% of those cases or, or of those failing small businesses are actually filing for bankruptcy. And the number is probably even less. So the key point to take here is that most small businesses, when they fail, they do not file for bankruptcy. They do other things. And those other things um, involve suing or getting sued in civil or state court. So what are the procedures for this? Well, if you're a secured creditor and you have a small business that's just closed their doors and walked away, then in theory, you can foreclose on your collateral, right? You can go in, you can seize the collateral that's been pledged to you, and then you can just take it. There have been some interesting papers around anti-recharacterization laws, which make it harder for debtors to shift assets that have been pledged as collateral into special purpose vehicles, essentially making uh, the law more creditor friendly. Now, what if you're an unsecured creditor? What do you do if a small business debtor closes their doors and disappears? Well, one thing that you might be worried about is that there's still cash left in the business or there are unencumbered assets, assets that hadn't been pledged as collateral. And you're probably gonna be worried that the owner of the business is gonna try and abscond with those assets, right? Maybe they'll like deposit them in their own bank account or they'll kind of give the assets to their brother-in-law or something like that. This is all governed by fraudulent transfer law, which is uh, varies at the state level. And so I've done some research on this. Finding generally uh, that fraudulent transfer laws that become stricter, right? So friendlier towards creditors actually have adverse outcomes on um, rates of, of business startups or entrepreneurship, implying that the debt effect over, uh, sorry, the demand effect overwhelms the supply effect. Uh, an interesting area for research is I haven't seen any empirical papers on fraudulent preferences. So remember I said that debt can come from outsiders, but also from insiders. Pretend that you're a small business owner and your business fails. You have a loan to your mom and then you have a loan to American or you know credit from American Express. Which one are you gonna pay back first? I mean, I hate to say it, but if it were me, I would probably pay back my mom first. That's called a fraudulent preference, you know, unless your mom technically has some sort of priority over the credit card. And so uh, this question of whether credit card companies even go after fraudulent preferences or kind of the extent to which friendly fraudulent preference laws discourages unsecured credit, that's an uh, interesting open question, but unfortunately it would be pretty hard to pursue empirically. And then finally, there's kind of a chapter seven equivalent in state law called an assignment for the benefit of creditors or an ABC. That's basically just a liquidation by a state trustee rather than a bankruptcy trustee. And so, um, I don't think that there's, you know, a huge amount of potential research in terms of whether one sort of trustee is more efficient or inefficient at selling assets than another, but there have been some interesting legal papers written in this area. Now, the one area of state debtor creditor law that has attracted the most attention is the area of exemptions. What is an exemption? It's the idea that a certain amount of equity in important assets are protected. And what are those important assets? You know, they're like a house or a car, things that are deemed to be essential to surviving. Uh, and so what these state laws do is that even if you as a small business owner have guaranteed your business debts with the equity you have in your house, some of that equity is protected no matter what. And what's interesting is that there are huge variations across states in what these equity amounts are and various assets and these uh, these rules tend to change over time. So you can imagine that that sets up a pretty nice kind of quasi natural experiment uh, for researchers to understand the impact of these exemptions. Um, and here again, the idea is similar, which is that risk averse business owners um, would demand more credit if exemptions go up, whereas creditors would reduce their supply of credit if exemptions go up. 
And so um, the literature here has looked both cross-sectionally and you know, exploiting changes in these exemption levels. Uh, I think you know, two, the most common pair of researchers here are Geraldo Serpiera and Maria Peñas, who have looked at these both cross-sectionally and across time. And I think mostly what they found, even though there are some mixed results here, is that when exemption levels go up, i.e. that's friendly to the debtor, unfriendly to creditors, then the supply effect tends to overwhelm. So the supply of credit to small business owners goes down and there tends to be less entrepreneurship and uh, innovative activity. There's also a nice theory paper by Eduardo de Vila on optimal exemption levels. So what are some data sources and new avenues for research on state debtor creditor law? As I've pointed out, you know, most of these empirical papers study ex ante efficiency uh, relying on census data is kind of the common form of studying ex ante bankruptcy or uh, distress resolution efficiency. If you want to study ex post efficiency, then you kind of need state court data, and that is incredibly hard to collect. So individual counties kind of maintain their own filing systems. There's no country level pacer when it comes to state courts. And so some counties are amenable to researchers. Uh, I think I've seen a couple studies using. Um, state court filings from Cook County, Illinois. Uh, but really, if you want to do like a state by state study, you're going to have to go to many counties and ask for a lot of data. And each one is going to have its own separate filing system. It's going to be messy. There is a, a project by courtstatistics.org to kind of aggregate some very basic stats across um, county courts in the country. And this is actually something that like I'm super interested in. I'm kind of hoping I can do some pro bono work for them, you know, maybe do some data work in exchange for understanding how they're getting these aggregate statistics. So if you're interested in this, then please let me know and you know, maybe we can collaborate down the road. Some ideas here in terms of concrete research topics. Um, one that I've like always been interested in is looking at variation in foreclosure enforcement based on how strained resources are at sheriff's offices. So kind of in the same way that like if you want to evict a tenant, you need to go get the sheriff to help you evict. If you're a secured creditor and you want to foreclose on your collateral, then you might need to get the help of the sheriff to actually do that. And so when sheriff's offices are busy for kind of exogenous reasons, then in some sense that is kind of limiting the rights of secured creditors to foreclose. And so I think that would be kind of a cool paper to write empirically. Uh, another idea is looking at the impact of state law variation, kind of some of the um, the laws that I've already mentioned, except looking at the credit supply using Mintel data. I don't know how expensive Mintel data is, but it's kind of a cool data source that allows you to track the offers that credit card companies are making to individuals across the country over time, uh, both in terms of you know, how much credit they're offering, the interest rates, uh, bonus periods where there's like zero interest. And so it'd be kind of cool to trace out the, the credit supply curve and how that is affected by these various state laws. Uh, I think there's a cool paper in terms of unsecured credit supply and costly enforcement. As you can probably tell, to actually go after these small businesses is very costly, right? You have to go to state court and you have to sue and you have to litigate and each state has different procedures. And so my sense is that credit card companies actually don't litigate a lot of what they could in theory. And so, you know, it'd be cool to just have like a, a costly effort paper in this field and how that affects equilibrium uh, amounts of credit. And then finally, it would be cool to look at the tunneling of assets by serial entrepreneurs. Um, the extent to which they can take the old assets out of a business and kind of invest them in a new business. And if your creditors are lazy and they don't want to sue you, you might get away with it. Um, I wonder if you can do this using LBD data, if the name of the entrepreneur is available and if you can see the same entrepreneur kind of starting the same sort of business down the road um, and looking at whether that sort of churn varies based on the strictness of fraudulent transfer laws. Just another idea. Uh, how much time do I have left, Song? None? 10, sorry. Oh, 10. <laughs> 10. Okay, cool. All right, so that's actually not too bad. Um, I'd like to briefly talk about high growth startups because so far, you know, what I've had in the back of my mind is the small business that I want you to think about is not really your typical high growth startup. Um, so you know, here's a, a figure from a paper by Will Mann, which I'll talk about in a second. But first, what is a high growth startup and how are those distinguished from regular small businesses? 
they tend to have slightly different defining characteristics. Um, I mean, what I want you to think about is like a small business that's formed by an HBS MBA who is like 27 years old and is trying to get venture capital financing. But kind of from, from a broader definitional point, uh, some of the characteristics have, that have been highlighted are that high growth startup entrepreneurs tend to be more risk tolerant. Uh, they tend to receive financing from different sources, in particular venture capital and angel financing, and they tend to have different governance characteristics. So to the extent that they receive venture capital, then some of those VC investors might sit on the board of the startup or the small business. So what do we know about bankruptcy of high growth startups? The answer is, we basically don't know anything. I mean, I think that there's been one paper really written about the bankruptcy of high growth startups and it was written by Song. So if you have any questions about this at the end then you should ask Song and not me. But the reason that we don't know much about the bankruptcy of high growth startups is because the popular wisdom is that they don't use debt. Uh, why don't they use debt? Well, A, they don't really have that many pledgeable assets uh, to collateralize their debt. And B, they tend to have very volatile cash flows in the early stages of their life. And so that's not a great time to borrow or to have debt in the capital structure because you're risking losing control rights over this potentially valuable startup. Now, there are exceptions to this kind of popular wisdom that startups don't use debt. And one exception is in the area of patents, high patenting firms. There, they do have assets that they can pledge as collateral. And so there's uh, some interesting kind of recent and emerging research about the use of patents as collateral, how that can facilitate access to credit. And like I mentioned, uh, Song, along with co-authors uh, Joy Tong and Wei Wang have looked at how those patents are treated in bankruptcy. And they found something kind of peculiar, a puzzle, which is that you, know, you would expect that the purpose of bankruptcy is to reallocate assets from less productive uses to more productive uses. Right? That's kind of why we study ex post bankruptcy efficiency at all. And so if you're a patenting firm and you have two different types of patents, kind of peripheral ones and core ones, then you would expect that in bankruptcy, they would kind of get rid of the peripheral ones first, or they would sell them off first while maintaining the core ones. And we would expect that that would be consistent with efficient asset reallocation. But what Song and his co-authors find is actually the opposite, that bankrupt firms tend to sell off their core patents first. So this is an interesting puzzle that may stem from various frictions in the bankruptcy system, uh, including kind of a lack of liquidity. Now, another exception to the rule that startups don't use debt in the capital structure is in the area of venture debt, which I think is very understudied and pretty cool, but you'll see in a moment while it's understudied, why it's understudied. Uh, there's one kind of paper, very descriptive law paper from about 10 years ago by Ibrahim characterizing what venture debt is. And he notes that there's kind of two reasons or two strategic reasons for the provision of venture debt. One is that um, banks for startups can you know, accept deposits by startups and then they can use the cash in the bank as collateral against loans. And so that seems kind of obvious, right? If startups don't have debt because there's no assets to pledge as collateral, then bank in the bank, oh, sorry, money in the bank is a clear source of um, collateral that you can pledge. But another interesting reason that venture lenders extend credit is actually a source of uh, bridge financing between rounds of equity. So say you've received a, an A round of venture capital equity investment and you're expecting a B round, but it's kind of taking a long time, then venture lenders can step in and they can provide you with some bridge financing in the period during which you're waiting. And here, you know, when it comes to venture lending of the latter sort, I've seen almost no research in the finance world, uh, even though I think that the, the Hochberg, Serrano, and Sedona's paper do touch on some of these ideas. Uh, in terms of data, a lot of the patent papers rely on USPTO assignment data so they can kind of track who owns those patents over time. And when it comes to venture debt, Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, depending on how you look at it, there's really only one source of data, which is Silicon Valley Bank, because they have you know, a pretty large market share in this venture lending industry. Uh, according to, I think, like what the CEO announced last year, it was about a 60 to 70% market share. And so on one hand, you know, there's really only a case study to be written. But on the other hand, if you can somehow convince the CEO of Silicon Valley Bank to give you loan level data, then that could be a pretty interesting uh, paper to be written. So some ideas here, um, one, does denture 
does venture debt deter venture equity? So is there kind of a venture debt overhang problem that might uh, kind of shift the calculus of subsequent rounds of VC equity investors? There are some new entrants into the space of uh, fintech venture lenders, such as Mercury Bank, Bank Novo. I'm interested in what their strategies are. I don't know whether this is an empirical paper or a theoretical paper that I have in mind. My sense is that some of these are trying to be kind of, um, I don't know, like extractive. They might be seeking to control these startup firms by convincing them to borrow a little bit and then going after uh, their valuable assets in bankruptcy. And so whether or not this is a strategy of these new lenders, whether they're really coercive, I think is uh, yet to be seen. And then, you know, a more simple question is, can high growth startups even reorganize in bankruptcy? You know, we know that patenting firms do reorganize to some extent based on Song's research, but for those very early stage high growth startups, how often do they go bankrupt? We really have no idea. Uh, according to the Ibrahim paper, there are very low default rates on uh, venture debt. And so you're probably not going to find that much incidence of you know, early stage high growth chapter 11 cases. And if you do, firm age is hard to infer from PACER. You really have to dig through the, uh, the bankruptcy documents. But for what it's worth, you know, I know of virtually zero research in this area. And the last points that I want to make uh, are kind of outside the scope of everything I've talked about so far. There are a couple closing thoughts on where I think small business bankruptcy research ought to go. And the first is really like a macro finance idea. So if you look at this figure here, this shows you how many small businesses were open in the beginning of 2020, right before COVID hit, and then how many small businesses were open as of December 30th, 2020. And from what you can see, uh, small businesses open decreased by about 30% over the course of the year. Now, of course, some of those are just temporary closings, but you can probably infer from this uh, figure that a lot of small businesses permanently, permanently went out of business as a result of COVID, and um, this number is not trivial. However, what I think is interesting is that from what I can tell, you know, they haven't really impacted the macro economy. Now, obviously, there's a lot of endogeneity there. Like, who knows what's going on as a result of COVID versus as a result of aggregate demand shocks versus as a result of kind of spillover effects. But at least when it comes to the stock market, things are fine. And I think in particular, it's seeming to look like even if a quarter of our small businesses go out or go under permanently, that that's not really, at least in the short run, having many kind of macroeconomic spillover consequences. So I think it would be cool to, if you're a macroeconomist or you know, people who do macrofinance research, and I'm sure there aren't many watching this talk, but I would love to see a paper that kind of presents like a, a core periphery model where small businesses are on the periphery because of like a limited supply chain, limited networks. And even if they go out of business en masse, they don't actually affect the core of the economy. It seems like kind of a relatively simple idea. Maybe there's research out there. I kind of did a very perfunctory search and didn't seem to find anything or very cursory search. Uh, so I think that that's a cool idea for macro finance. And then another idea that's kind of in that vein is, you know, what is the utility of a small business sector? And how much of it that isn't really captured in like, you know, what we consider GDP statistics. And what I mean by that is, uh, let's say you live in an area and you're surrounded by 10 restaurants and those 10 restaurants are all small businesses versus those 10 restaurants are all like Olive Gardens and uh, KFCs and stuff. How much value loss do you experience when you move from the small business state of the world to a kind of chain restaurant state of the world? How much of that isn't captured in what we know? And so what are we really losing by experiencing this kind of like mass die off of small businesses? I think these are open questions that are kind of hard to answer. Now, maybe a little simpler to answer, but uh, data intensive are the behavioral aspects of uh, small business failure and the anticipation of the small business failure decision. Uh, those can include over-optimism and limited attention. So as a result of having you know, thought about this for the past few years, every time I see a small business owner, I ask them how much they know about bankruptcy, I ask them whether they've ever heard of the idea of fraudulent transfers, what they know about personal exemption law, and the answer is almost resoundingly nothing. That they have not thought about these ideas, that they don't want to think about the ideas, that it's too complicated, that they'll deal with it when the time comes, stuff like that. And so 
if you think about it, this is pretty bad news for all of those ex ante efficiency studies. Because if you think about a change in state laws or a change in bankruptcy law, if you can find one, then in order to find ex ante ex ante consequences, you kind of need small business owners that can rationally anticipate what the bankruptcy laws are. And so why are we seeing these effects if they don't actually know what those bankruptcy laws are or how they work? And so I think it would be cool to see some survey evidence of what some of these behavioral biases are in small business owners, how that affects the startup decision and how that affects you know, what they know about bankruptcy and how bankruptcy actually plays out when it uh, comes to pass. And you know, as a concluding thought, Ben Iverson and some of his co-authors are working on a new paper. I don't think that they have a draft written yet, but they're doing a cool kind of randomized, randomized controlled experiment where they're providing different types of information to small business owners about bankruptcy. I mean, it's not wrong. It's just that you know, it's more information versus less information in these settings and looking at the choices that they make about um, you know, what they're gonna do after COVID. And I would love to see more of these types of uh, papers going forward. So having said all that, now I think maybe, uh, maybe I ended two minutes late, but uh, thanks for listening and I'm looking forward to all your questions. Thank you so much, Katie. Thanks for a, a very insightful and fabulous uh, lecture and uh, um, much appreciated. And for those of you who still have a lot of questions, or um, please feel free um, to stay and um, uh, ask the questions to Kate. And uh, for those of you um, who has been constantly supporting the lecture, I will see you next uh, lecture. And uh, thank you.